question for the course is kind of twofold, I would say. The first thing is to get you guys some experience with writing out equations that describe systems of interest, um, separations, reactions, systems, things like this, okay? Um, so we call this mathematical modeling. We're interested in this for chemical engineering systems. We're not interested in modeling pendulums or mass spring systems or things like that that you might see in physics, all right? Um, and the second main objective, which I should have probably put in there, but I didn't, um, is to start teaching you guys MATLAB, okay? So we've made a decision in the department to have MAP, uh, MATLAB propagate through the whole curriculum. It used to be taught by me the first time in the junior years, the first time students were really exposed to it. So it's got to be a bit of a crunch course. So we're trying to push it so that you guys are introduced to MATLAB. If you don't know what MATLAB is, basically a computational environment where you can solve problems that you can't do easily on pen and paper. So a problem that might take you 10 minutes on a pen and paper will take you, you know, a millisecond in MATLAB. So you'll begin to appreciate the power of it, I hope. Um, we're using it instead of MathCAD, which I don't know if you've seen MathCAD, but we're kind of phasing out MathCAD to use this MATLAB. It has a little more overhead in terms of learning, but it's a lot more powerful. So it's a bit of a trade-off, but I think if you guys start to see it in every course a little bit, then you'll have a really good handle on using it. And this is the kind of tool that when you go into industry, assuming that's where most of you will go and get a job, you're pretty young. This is the youngest group I've ever taught. I've never taught anything less than juniors before. So I guess you're a long ways away from worrying about getting a job. Um, but you entered this major, I hope, with the idea that that was a possibility, right? Okay. Um, so when you get a job and you go to work for a chemical company or a biotech company or a materials company or whatever it might be, it would be very likely they'll have MATLAB on the desktop for you to use, okay? So I think it's a very important thing for you to learn. All right, so with that introduction out of the way, you can see that's who I am. You guys know where the life science building is. It's, it's this palatial structure um, where a few of us blessed individuals have been able to relocate. Um, and so that's where I'm located. There's my email. I can tell you, um, that if you want to get a hold of me, email's the best option, and I hate to admit it, but I'm almost always checking email, much to my wife's chagrin, okay? So if you send me an email like Sunday night at 11.30, I hate to say it, but you probably will get a response, okay? Holidays, not of interest to me. Go ahead and send emails, all right? Um, so here's the prerequisites. Um, everyone should have had 120, right? That, so I'm going to use a lot of stuff from 120, and I'm going to assume you know that. I'm not going to review that. You should be taking in parallel uh, thermo, right? You guys are in there, right? Who's teaching that? Wei Fan? Okay. And then you should be in differential equations, right? We're not going to partake that much of thermo, to be honest, because um, I get to pick my examples and thermo is not my favorite subject, you know? Um, it, hopefully it'll be yours, though. But differential equations is absolutely critical. Who's teaching that from the math department? Is it one section for you guys, or is it multiple sections? Okay, well, I'll look it up. I won't make you. Okay. So th th we, we, ha we developed a strategy with the math department that they would teach out of the same book. Okay, are they teaching out of this book? Yeah. Okay. Um, and so they will probably go through the first part of the book. They'll take the whole semester to do it, and it, it will give you a very good background, hopefully, on differential equations. Okay. So we're going to be interested in not, um, you know, you'll learn all these things like, um, integrating factors and things like that, but how to, how to pose and solve differential equations for real problems of interest to us. I assume the book is available. You'll need the book. You know, students always ask me, do I really have to get the book? I'm like, yeah. Um, it's expensive probably. My guess is $150 or something for the book. I don't know. Um, but it is used at least in two courses instead of one, so that's a bit, bit of an improvement compared to what we normally come up with. Um, the you know, some students ask me, can I get the ninth edition? Because the ninth edition is a fraction of the tenth edition, you know, but I can't guarantee compatibility. So if I say something about the book, I can't guarantee it'll apply to the ninth edition, but you can, you can do that, I guess, if you want to try. Okay, so here's the syllabus. Um, some of this I'll go over a little bit later. So you can see, so we, <laughs> we're not very, we don't have a course for this, number for this course yet, because it's new. I think it's going to be ultimately called 231. But you can see I have it called Mathematical Modeling Princely's for Sophomores. Because you know there's another sec section being taught for the juniors because they need this course too and we have to do this one time. Future will be just for sophomores. Um, class, as you can read, like, I can't really look up there but I can look here. If you look at the course description, you'll see there's three uh, main parts of the course. The first part's going to be Applied Statistics, okay? I do that first because I, I think you guys all have the background for that. Because it doesn't require any differential equations or anything like that, okay? 
So it'll be about a month of applied statistics. It's not meant to be, I don't know if any of you had a statistics course, it's not meant to be, you know, proving why things are true. It's meant to, how do you use the tools, okay? I'll teach you how to do the things in pen and paper. I'll teach you some of the underlying theory enough so you know what you're doing, so it makes some sense. And then we'll learn how to do it all in MATLAB as well, okay? Um, second part of the course is going to be linear algebra and, and nonlinear algebra. Mm -hmm. So not linear, sets of linear and nonlinear algebraic systems, okay? So um, it's, me it's meant to be self-contained. So if you've not had a class in linear algebra, it's fine. It's, uh, it's, if you have, it's, it's helpful, right? Because you'll already know what I'm talking about. Um, and that will go, I think, for about a month as well, okay? So we'll talk about how to solve alge linear algebraic equations. That's trivial to do, obviously. The key is how do you solve systems of them? like 10 equations and 10 unknowns. Anybody can solve one linear equation and one unknown, I hope, okay? And also, how do you solve nonlinear algebraic equations? And as we go along, um, I'm gonna pull out exam chemical engineering examples for all these things, okay? So we do statistics, I'll pull out data analysis problems for chemical engineering <laughs> problems. And same thing for linear algebra. I'll give you models of linear algebraic systems that come from chemical engineering problems, all right? And finally, um, at the end, where I hope that will mesh with the differential equation course for about the last month, I will talk about differential equations, okay? So we're gonna talk about how to write out models. You know, a big part of the course is how you formulate the models, right? So one thing is, once you have a set of equations, how do you solve them? Yeah, that's important, but you have to get the set of equations in the first place. And so when you take a course in math, they usually just give you the set of equations. They're so like, here's a differential equation, how do you solve it? Well, that's not the way it works. <laughs> I mean, you could argue that posing and formulating the differential equation is a lot more challenging than solving it. Because solving it is just, you could give a differential equation to a mathematician, you could solve it. But for the problems we talk about, most likely only a chemical engineer could write the equation because of transport, reaction, kinetics, separations, okay? Um, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about numerical methods, okay? By numerical methods, I mean, if you have a differential equation, which you guys don't kind of know what they are probably <laughs> fully at this point, and you can't solve it by hand, then you're gonna solve it numerically. We're gonna, I'm gonna teach you how to do it in MATLAB. But my feeling about using these kind of computer-aided tools is you should have some idea of what they're doing. Like, you don't wanna write your own code, right? You don't wanna write your own MATLAB. That's a waste of time. But you don't wanna use MATLAB with no idea what it's doing. Because I see students come in and they say, MATLAB said this. And I go, MATLAB tells you it failed. <laughs> They're like, oh, okay. So you want to have some idea of when, you know, how to use MATLAB, what does it mean? You know, because when you solve differential equations, they have like 10 different ways to do it. How do you pick which way for which problem, things like this. All right, I'm going to go over the objectives at the very end, so I don't really want to do that now. Um, some of this has been, you've already seen the prerequisites, you've already seen the text. Okay, this thing at the bottom is critical. And by critical, I mean you need, you need this tomorrow. Okay, can't be any more time critical than that. All right, so it should be, um, so many times in the class I'm gonna tell you how things should be and then I'm gonna tell you the way they are. It should be that when you come in as freshmen, you're told exactly what you need, like here's the platform, computing platform you need, like you need this minimal computing requirements if you're running Windows or if you're running Apple, we're running Mac, right? And then we should tell you you gotta buy this software, but we don't, so I'm telling you now, okay? You've got to go buy this. I can't give it to you for free. Um, if you want to get it without buying it, that's none of my business, but okay. Um, but you need the student version of MATLAB. It's available for $99. It'll be used the next three years. It's supposed to be used the next three years by everybody, okay. So it's not a big investment. It's, it's like, what, $16 per semester. Compare that to a book, which is 10 times that amount. So it's not a big investment. Um, and you're gonna need it, because what we're gonna do every Wednesday is we're gonna do nothing but MATLAB. Okay, so every Wednesday we're going to come in here and I'm going to lead you through some MATLAB tutorial thing and then you're going to actually work on solving a problem in MATLAB. Okay, so, you know, I think what you guys are used to is people lecturing at you. Always get these, you know, students always say they don't like it, but in reality they don't know any other way. <laughs> okay, so when we do these recitation sections on Wednesday, we're going to spend about 25 minutes on me presenting some tool in MATLAB give you an example, and then 25 minutes or so, you solving a problem. If you don't have a computer with MATLAB on it, you're just gonna sit there for 25 minutes, staring into space, or staring at a friend's computer, okay? So it's important that you get this, and again, you'll, you'll use it throughout the rest of the curriculum, so I'm hoping it's not a big burden for you guys. Okay, class times. You know, when I first got here, I'm like, what's the recitation section? They're like, oh, that's, you can use that if you want. 
Okay, I was like, well, do, you, do I want to? <laughs> They're like, I don't know. So um, I've decided I want to in spades, okay? So it's used every single possible Wednesday is scheduled. You'll see the schedule, okay? Um, most of the time we're going to do MATLAB. A couple of times I'll do reviews for tests on Wednesdays. Okay, the tests will usually be on Thursdays, I think. All right, um, I already told you where I am. There's my email. Get familiar with it. I'm teaching assistant. Okay. I assume you guys have had this experience. There's not enough TAs for your course. Have you had that in chemical engineering yet? So what do we have, 90 students? We have one TA, okay? So what, I what I've done in this class, and I did again this semester, is I've, I've uh, found three undergraduates that took the course, they're seniors, and they're gonna be additional TAs for the course, okay? So you're gonna have one graduate TA, it's gonna kind of run the whole TAing part of the course. Um, and then there'll be three undergraduates, they'll primarily just do grading, but they'll be available like to help you with MATLAB and things like that. So hopefully there'll be enough support so you guys feel like, you know, because the professor, as you probably found, is limited accessibility, right? We're just not available 10 or 20 hours a week to help you with things. But, and one TA gets stretched pretty thin. Okay, so if, if I give a homework assignment uh, once a week, and let's say there's 10 of them and there's 90 people, well, you get the math, right? That's well, I can't do the math. What, nine? Okay, got 90 people, 10 homeworks. That's 900 homeworks to grade. That's a, that's a bit much. You, so hopefully with these um, people that have taken this course before as juniors, it's a little bit different, but it's actually more advanced. They all got really high grades. They're really knowledgeable, and they're really, I think they'll really do a good job. I've used these graders before. It'll work well. Okay? We're also closer to your age, so you'll, you'll like that. They, they know your pain to the extent you'll have pain. Okay. Um, grading. Okay, the textbook's available electronically, I should mention, but you can't use that during an exam, right? Because I can't have someone open, the, like their computer open during an exam, because they just might run MATLAB <laughs> in the background. So, you know, it's available, but I'm not sure what the value of it is, because you, you're going to need the, you, you're going to need the book, I think, you know, because the book at a minimum has tables in the back for statistics, you have to have those. So, all right, so here's the grading. Um, there is going to be a series of homeworks, okay? Um, I'm going to try to keep these homeworks short and sweet um, with the exception of two or three MATLAB homeworks I'll give, okay? So there'll be written homework every week. I hope if, if I can control them, I always get over-enthusiastic, but I'm hoping I can give you one problem, might have multiple parts that shouldn't take you a long time, but it'll give you some experience working the problems as you go along. If you don't have any experience working the problems until the test, it's not, not good right? The problem is if you have one TA you can't assign homework every week because there's no way for the TA to grade them. But now we have the capability. So I'll give you homework every week and then for each of the modules there'll be a, there'll be a MATLAB homework. Okay, that'll be a more extensive, longer problem where we guide you how to solve a real problem using linear algebra, statistics, or whatever in MATLAB. Okay? Alright, now you see this thing called project. You guys probably never done a project before, I'm guessing. I don't know. I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe it's part of chemical engineering you've never had a project, or maybe 110 has a project, I don't know. Okay. Um, so this is going to consist of teams of four people. Oh, by the way, the um, homeworks you have to do by yourself. What does that mean? That means you can't copy verbatim. Okay. I expect that you guys are going to work together, and you, you know, that's the way it works, right? No, it's, this is too hard to learn by yourself completely. Um, but everyone needs to turn on an own independent solution. We can always tell when people are copying because they make the same mistake and it, like, you know, 23 people have the same ridiculous mistake or something like this. Okay. Um, and I, and I, just to warn you, I took, I'm not trying to scare, but th two years ago I took 33 students to the office of whatever that's called, stu you know, where you turn people in for cheating and 33 people got caught cheating. Okay. Um, so, it, it's homework. It's not, you know, the point of the homework is not, obviously it's worth 15%. It's stupid not to do it because you lose 15%. The real point of the homework is so you can do well on the remaining 75% of the exams, okay? So it's in your own best interest to try to do the homework yourself. I mean, with, with some talking to people, you know. If you just copy the homework and, you know, you're lucky and we don't catch you, then you'll get to 15%, but you'll bomb the exams, okay? All right. Um, so the project, back to the project. So that'll be groups of four people, okay? And um, the idea is that you have to actually propose a topic. Right now you have no idea what to propose, <laughs> right? You'll see it on the schedule, but you propose a topic and then it's due the last day of class. It's, it's not supposed to be 
a hugely elaborate project like you're going to face when you t take senior design or senior lab. But it's meant for you to actually define a problem yourself and go through all the steps of solving the problem. Because when I give you a MATLAB homework, I'm going to give you the problem I want you to solve and I'm going to guide you through it. So to really learn how to use MATLAB, it's a MATLAB project. You have to, you have to pick a problem yourself and do it. Okay, so that's what that's about. Okay, we'll have two midterm exams. We'll have a final exam. You can see that. Uh, the all exams are open book. Okay, I don't believe in making people like remember. I, I can't remember anything, so what can I say? Um, but the exams tend to be pretty long and you can't know nothing coming in. You're like, you can't say open book, that's awesome, I don't need to study, right? Because if you're flipping through the book or notes trying to figure out where the material is that you're trying to find that I'm asking you about, you're, you're, in, you're in trouble, right? So I mean, if you know, ah, linear differential equation, flip to the notes, ah, there's, th there's the equation I need to use, then it's fine, right? And I don't want you to have to memorize it, but you do need to know what you're doing, not just bring the book. Um, so um, I also got, I've got students for this, right? They, um, they bring in inappropriate materials, okay? So you can see what's allowed. Oh, you can bring the book, you can bring in the lecture notes that I'm gonna post on the website, which I'll tell you about, and you can bring in anything that you completed. Your old exams, your old homeworks, anything like that, okay? All right. Um, homeworks, okay, one per week, do them in, by yourself with some help, turn in independent solution, uh, MATLAB homeworks, three a semester, um, do them in groups of two, turn in one assignment for two people, okay? Project, one at the end of the semester, you have to propose a topic, I have to okay it, that's 20% of the grade, and then you turn in one thing the last day of class for um, four people, right? Um, soon, but not yet because I don't have my TA lined up. I have my TA but I haven't had a chance to talk to him because it's got assigned. Everything will go up on this website. So every lecture that I'm about to give, which I use PowerPoint, and that's controversial sometimes, but it's, it's not really, I'm not really very flexible. Um, but every PowerPoint lecture will go up there. So ideally, I mean, if I were you, I would glance at the PowerPoint lecture before you came in. I would print it out on one of the four, you know, those things where you can print out the slide and then you have a place to comment. And I personally would just make, write notes in the comment section of the slides, but it's up to you, okay? Um, I try to, de-densify my slides because I have a tendency to put a lot on slides. I think for the most part I've taken care of that, but there still might be more than you feel like copying, right? If all you're doing is copying all the equations, then you're probably not listening to what I'm saying. So you might want to print out the notes. I'll put old exams up there. I guess, where's my boy Ezra up there? Is he up there? Or do you just take off? He just like it's filming, I'm out of here. Okay, well, you might wonder why there's a dude back there that was back there with a camera. You see this guy? You see this camera? It's videotaping me now. Um, that's because all, we're gonna put, we did this last semester for my control course, put all videos of the lectures up on the website as well, okay? So that's, it's not, so meant, it's not really meant so you to not come to class, but um, it's, it's gonna be used in the future, I hope. You ever heard this term flipping a class? It means you provide lectures on like YouTube and then class is all problem solving. And so the student's homework is you gotta look at the lecture before you come in and you know, go through it, and then during class, it's all about pro solving problems, not about lecturing material. So that's, that's the idea. Whether well, they'll have the courage to do it, well, that's for the future, okay? Attendance, you know, I don't take attendance. You should attend class. I mean, you're paying a lot of money. Um, this is your future. If you value it, you'll come to class. You know, sometimes you're gonna miss class. There. Um, I know it's unavoidable, but generally speaking, you should try to come to class. I try, um, I'm notoriously good at keeping, uh, catching people for cheating and prosecuting them, <laughs> okay? Um, that is a bad habit to get into in an early part of your career thinking you can take shortcuts, okay? That gets people, careers destroyed once they get jobs, okay? And so you don't want to engage in this type of um, behavior now thinking that, you know, you're just taking a little shortcut because that grows and then at some point, you know, it can be curtains for you if you get caught like falsifying data for ExxonMobil or something. That's not only the end of your career at ExxonMobil, that's the end of your career period because who's going to hire you after that, right? So um, don't, I don't, I don't want to, you know, we should really have a, we should introduce you guys as freshmen to this type of thing. I don't think we do a very good job. I've talked to people about that, but, um, you know, and it's, it's with, the, with, the, with the internet and all the availability of information, some of it's a little bit of a gray area. Like, you know, what's, what's allowed and what's not. But let's put it this way, if it's not your work, it's not allowed, okay? So it's, it's pretty cut and dry. All right, all right, with that out of the way, 
I will go back to the slides in principle. All right, so we just went through the syllabus. All right, so at the very end, I'm going to go through the schedule. But for now, I'm going to give you a kind of some motivation for what we're trying to do in the course and give you some examples. Like I said, not all the examples you might understand because they might be differential equations, but at least you'll get some idea of where we're headed. Okay. So being um, in a grandiose way, I boil down chemical engineering to four bullet points. <laughs> okay, it's a little bit a little bit more general than this, but so what, what do we want to do? So we want to understand systems that we work with. So for, for the standpoint of this class, we think most mainly about processes, but you know, chemical engineers work on materials, you know, macromolecules, polymers, and so molecular scale things, and they work on biotechnology. So these could be systems as well as processes, but so first thing we want to do is to perform experiments. I use the word designed experiments because experiments tend to be costly, they're time consuming, they take a lot of manpower, and so you, you just don't aimlessly um, perform experiments. So I've done a lot of consulting with chemical companies and so I know how they do this. Um, and so if you're going to go into an operating plant that's making a product, you have to think out very carefully how you're going to do an experiment, right, on the plant, because the plant's still making material that's going to be sold. Um, so the idea of doing these experiments is we want to combine data with some mechanistic understanding of the system, right? So the way it really works is that, so when you take a class, um, let's say like material balances, you know, okay, mass is conserved, we, we get the idea. Um, <laughs> for most systems, you know, mass conservation is not enough to fully understand the system. And so you typically have to combine some level of detailed mechanistic understanding, like understanding of the physics and chemistry of the system, with some kind of experiments. Because there's always things you don't understand about the system that you need to get from data. Okay? So it's usually a combination of the two. Once you have those two things, you can formulate a model. Okay? So a model, I mean, it's a, it's a mathematical description of the system you, you're interested in operating or understanding. Um, this will typically take the form of this class of algebraic, sets of algebraic equations and differential equations, which we'll talk about in a minute. Once you have the model available to you, you can do a lot of things with it, right? You could do like virtual experiments. So everyone knows what a refinery is, right? So if you're, if you're, let's say you're in a refinery and you're an operator. Do you know what an operator is? An operator is the person that operates the refinery. They actually operate the control system that controls the... But anyway, they're responsible for keeping the uh, refinery going. So how do you train an operator? You don't just turn the operator loose on the refinery. You say, okay, there's a refinery, don't screw it up, okay? You, they actually have these huge training simulators. You've seen these for airplanes, right? Where someone pretends to fly an airplane. They have the same thing for chemical plants. Okay, they're detailed mathematical models that simulate the behavior. And then they, they make the operator respond to certain scenarios that, will hap that might happen in the plant, right? Once they past those, then they can go into the real plant, okay? So you can do things like that. You can do design things. So once you have a model, you can design, you know, heat exchangers, distillation columns, chemical reactors, and things based on the model, okay? So when someone's, you know, trying to build a, a unit for a plant, you know, it's not just, you know, like, I wonder how big it should be, <laughs> you know? It's like you do calculations. How do you do, cal you do calculations with a model, okay? What else are you going to calculate with, okay? So I think the, I'm, well, I, I would go so far as saying, I wouldn't say mathematical modeling is my entire life, but it's the part of my life I probably value more than any other, okay, with the exception of my family, okay. So if you see my wife, don't tell her that I said that. All right. Um, and so what makes modeling so cool um, is that it, so if you go into a company, okay, I talk a lot about chemical companies because I've worked with them, I'm hoping that gives you some meat for the kind of things I'm talking about. Um, let's say you make polymers. You guys know what polymers are? They're like little molecules hooked together in big chains to make things like, you know, pretty much everything like this, this thing here, or bottles that you drink Coke out of or whatever. Um, these, the, you know, how do they do this? Well, they, they have big reactors where they, do, where they make this. How do they operate these reactors? Well, over time, they've developed usually models of how these reactors work, okay? And the, you could argue the, the model that they have of the reactor, in, for the most part, is a representation of everything they know about the reactor. Okay? The nice thing about it is it's transferable. You can transfer a model to some new person that might operate the, the plant. It's hard to operate just knowledge. 
I mean, transfer knowledge, right? Someone's like, how do you work the reactor? And some guy just enumerates all the things that you should not do and do. Okay, that's not very quantitative. It's not very reproducible. So it's like a formal representation of what you know. It makes engineering cool compared to, you know what discovery science is, right? It's all the lesser disciplines that include the following. Chemistry, physics. Okay, that's, you're, gonna, you're used to my sense of humor, right? Part of being a chemical engineer is to insult all other fields, all right? <laughs> I'd say the electrical engineers are the only ones that maybe approach our level. Okay, um, so, no, I'm, I'm kidding. You shouldn't take me seriously sometimes, most times. Um, so, we're, engineering's different than, you know, chemistry, physics, biology, right? We want to make things. We want to do things. We're not, we're not that interested in just discovering stuff because it's cool, right? We're, we have to actually make money, okay, which makes us different. Um, this ability to be quantitative, think about systems in terms of, you know, think about things in terms of systems and integrated processes and, and capture that in models makes you guys totally unique. Okay. And so you might say, why does Pfizer hire chemical engineers? Because w the things that Pfizer needs you to do, chem chemists and biologists can't do. <laughs> you know, they can't operate processes. They can't make anything. <laughs> you know, they can make it in a tube. Right? You know the whole scale up, like how do you take things from a lab scale and scale up to a real process. That only chemical engineers have the skills to do that. Okay? And a lot of these things are based on your ability to do modeling. Okay? Because the scale up, you have to have some way of scaling up. How are you going to do it? You can do it with a model. Okay? And so the way I think about this is that all the courses involve modeling. Right? So when you take material and energy balance, I assume you learn the you know, general material and energy balance, right? Like accumulation equals N minus out plus generation. Does this sound familiar? Um, that's a model, right? It's, it's a good one because mass is a conserved, conserved quantity. But so when you write out an equation for mass conservation, that's a model, right? It's a model of how the system works. All right. So you'll see this in all your courses. You already have, but you may not think of it in terms of a model. Okay. So if we want to model something, we go through the following steps. We do what I call experimental design. We're going to talk about that in the first part of the course. That's how do you rationally design the experiments to collect information. Okay. Experiments are costly, they're time consuming, and so you want to do the minimal amount of experiments to get as much information as you can. You can't do that haphazardly. Okay. And I saw a guy at ExxonMobil get fired for not doing that right. Okay. So he just did experiments without telling the people in the plant. That was the end for him. Okay. Um, so once you do the experiments, you have to do data collection analysis, right? It's not just enough to plant. You have to take the data. You have to do some kind of analysis on it. So um, the first part of the course is going to be how you statistically analyze the data to see if things are related to each other, do various tests on the data, analyze, you know, the data for what's good data and bad data and so things like this, okay? Um, later in the course, we'll talk a little bit about how you use this to build models, you know, how you use data to use models, okay. So once you have this data, then you formulate a model. So all our models, in this course at least, are based on fundamental conservation principles, right? So what's conserved? Mass, energy, momentum, right? I mean, there's other things conserved, but that's all we care about, right? We don't care about conservation of angular momentum because we don't have many things spinning around. Um, so we apply these conservation principles and then we apply things which I, I'll have to explain later to you probably call constitutive relations. They're not strictly true fundamentally, but they usually work. They complete the model. Okay, so it's like some combination of fundamentally true things plus generally accepted things. You put them together, you get a model. Okay. Now when you build these models, you usually have things that you don't know. So um, you guys, if you, if you, tell me if you've ever seen this equation. Okay, that's an equation for our reaction rate depends on temperature, right? All right, so that's great. So this is a r generally accepted constitutive relation, right? We accept that temperature depends, reaction rate will depend on temperature in this way, all right? So um, then you see there's a couple of things here. Those constants, right? This is called the frequency factor. It's called the activation energy. So if, let's say you, I give you a homework problem. I give you those, right? Let's say you work in a plant. Nobody gives you those, right? You don't know those. I mean, maybe it's a reaction like, you know, making polyethylene or something. People know these. But it, it'd be very common you're going to have parameters. These are called parameters. In your model, you don't know these things. So you have to get them from data somehow. 
And you get these by combining data and a model together, um, which we'll talk about. Okay. Um, so once you have the model, you know, you can do some, um, you, if the model's nice, which I'll talk about nice in a minute, you can solve it analytically. That means you can solve it on pen and paper. Okay. If it's not nice, it's not amenable to analytical solution, which is all you know at this point, I think, right? Um, then you have to solve it numerically on a computer. That's what MATLAB does. Solves problems of essentially, as far as you're concerned, arbitrary complexity that you can never do by hand. You could do this to get some what I call qualitative behavior or quantitative, which we'll talk about later. So, um, if I look at our curriculum from my twisted view of model-based uh, model world, <laughs> okay, this is what I see. I see all the classes that you're going to take in the future. The first one being kinetics, then fluids, um, then heat mass transfer, then separations, then design, and then control is all being model-based design. Okay? You get a model and then you design a reactor, or you get a model and then you model or analyze a heat exchanger or something like this. Okay? So the, when we first introduced this course in the junior year, it was because we saw a disconnect between the math department Right? You may have seen this disconnect yourself. And what we're doing, right? They teach math, we teach engineering, nary shall the two meet, right? So we, in the junior year, we decided to introduce this course, and then we thought the benefits would be greater if you guys got introduced to this even earlier. So that's the motivation. So we'll see how it works out. All right, so in terms of classifying models, I'm going to go through this, this list of different characteristics of models so that we can get some language down so you understand what I'm saying. So, if I say something is an algebraic equation or an algebraic model, it means it has no independent variables. What are independent variables? As far as we're concerned, there's, there's time and space, right? There's four. Time and there's three spatial coordinates, right? Those are all what we, I consider independent variables. If something's algebraic equation, it doesn't depend on anything of those variables. It doesn't depend on time or space, independent, okay? If something is an ODE, I should have spelled that out because you guys haven't had this class. It's ordinary differential equation, okay? Um, that means it has one independent variable. So that independent variable could be time or that independent variable could be some spatial coordinate, okay? Um, so we deal with both the first two extensively. The second, the third one we don't deal with, PDE, should have spelled it out, partial differential equation, okay? That's an equation that has two or more independent variables. So that might be something that varies in two spatial coordinates or might vary in a spatial coordinate time or something like that. It's a different ball game than what we're talking about, so it's outside the scope of this class. Okay? All right. So dimensionality. You, so anytime you see things in quotes, that means it's vague, and I'm, I choose not to define it. So if I say the model's low dimensional, if someone says it's a low dimensional problem, that means there's a couple of equations, you know, like one, two, three, something like that. Okay. If someone says it's, it's a high dimensional, it means there's a large number of equations. Okay. I've solved uh, models with 100,000 equations. I saw ExxonMobil solve one with a million equations. That's big, right? Okay. We won't be doing that, though. <laughs> we won't be dealing with a million equations. But I can tell you in MATLAB, if I gave you an algebraic model okay, of the first kind, you could solve a problem with 10,000 equations and 10,000 unknowns in a couple seconds. Okay. So it's, it's not intractable or anything like that. Okay, in terms of stationary, if I say the model steady state, I'm telling you time is not an independent variable. The, the system or model is independent of time. If I say dynamic, sometimes people say transient, sometimes they say unsteady state, it means all the same thing. It means time is an independent variable. Things change with time, okay? All right. 